Hello, everyone. Welcome to our fall webinar series. My name is Dr. Galvez. I'm a neuroscientist with an expertise in neurological disorders and neocortical mechanisms of memory consolidation. I'm faculty with the Carl Illinois College of Medicine and currently a medical education facilitator. Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Olivia Coyado. Um, I have a PhD in electrical and biomedical engineering. I'm a faculty at Carl Illinois College of Medicine. Another role, I'm course director director for discovery learning and also engineer lab thread director. So today we're going to talk to you about problem-based learning and why we're using it here at Carl Illinois, kind of a little bit of, of about problem-based learning, the advantages of it, and how it's basically run here. So let's go ahead and get started. So to give you a quick overview of where we're going to be going today in this webinar, we're going to first talk about what is PBL or problem-based learning. Then we'll go into why we are using PBL, specifically for our curriculum. What is the process and roles for a PBL session? And finally, we'll wrap it up with what are the rules for a PBL session? And we'll both be, um, basically, I'll be covering the first half of this and Dr. Codiado will be covering the second part of this. So let's first start with what is PBL. So in order to understand what a PBL is, I think you have to first take a step back and think about what is the kind of traditional approach to learning or delivering of educational information. And if you see here on the picture on your right, this is a very standard lecture hall where you have 100 plus students sitting in the lecture hall. The professor is down at the bottom here providing the information, basically providing um, the educational content to all of the students. We've all been in these types of situations. We've all, I've sat both as a student as well as a lecturer up here or in the front, in front of the students. And if you look at this, and, and many of you might have, obviously you've all experienced this, but in terms of thinking about the delivery of that information, you know, some of these people are paying attention, some people aren't, and you really have to wonder how engaged these individuals are. But with a problem-based learning session, these are very small groups. And so notice here are just several examples of problem-based learning sessions where the small groups are centered around a table, working together, communicating with each other, solving problems, and actually engaging in the a discussion with each other. And this type of learning, as you'll see in a minute, lends itself much more nice, nicely to understanding the, the particular material being covered and actually provides a very a much more deeper understanding of the information. So to discuss this in a little bit more detail, if this particular cartoon is one that I particularly like because I think it depicts very nicely the difference between a traditional approach depicted in the picture here on the left versus a problem-based learning session or a more active learning environment. In the more traditional approach, you can see the faculty member is simply pouring in the information into the students. It's basically disseminating that knowledge into the students, pouring it in, uh, regardless of whether the student is receptive, whether the student's ready for it, the instructor is almost forcing that information into the student. Whereas as in a problem-based learning scenario, the instructor is providing the tools for the student to bring that knowledge in. And you can see the student here is regulating that information and is regulating the flow of that information into them. And so this type of model lends itself so the student actually has more control over the information content and as it's coming into, um, into their conscious and, and what they're actually digesting. Now some aspects of problem-based learning. For one thing, it's case-based. And so you typically, as we'll see in a minute, as we go through this, you have a particular problem, or in our situation, we'll have a medical situation, a medical patient that has a particular ailment, and you now have to solve this problem. And so it's centered around this problem that you have to figure out how to solve. And again, this lends itself nicely to the student then working towards actually trying to figure out and regulate that flow of information in order to deal with that case. 
They're also, as you saw in the previous picture, they're done in very small groups. You're not looking at 100 or 200 students all sitting in the lecture hall. Here you have a very small group, typically six to eight students working in a small group, um, all trying to work through that particular case. With problem-based learning, it's also very student-focused. And again, this is very nicely depicted in this picture where rather than the instructor simply trying to force that educational information into the student, the student can then regulate the flow of that information. The student can actually decide which aspects of the learning issues do they need help on and focus on those aspects rather than all of the information and being forced information that maybe they already have a very good grasp on. Another very important feature here, and again depicted on this picture, is that problem-based learning is facilitated. It's not taught. So I've done many lectures where I've stood in front of students for 100 plus students where I disseminate out the knowledge and I talk for an hour or two hours sometimes. But in problem-based learning session, what we're doing is we're providing the students, we're providing all of you the tools so that you can learn the information, so you can acquire that information and again, learn, the, learn that content. And finally, the last one on this particular slide is with problem-based learning, it's often delivered in a very narrative format. So again, it's a case-based format where you have a particular case, the case unfolds in front of you, and there's a story. You need to figure out what you need to know, you need to research it, and that gives you more insight into what's happening during that narrative. So why are we using problem-based learning here at Carl, Illinois? Well, again, I go back to this very traditional approach with the lecture hall sitting here. And you might be thinking, well, I've attended many lectures that are presented in this format. This is how I learned. So what's wrong with it? Why not just continue doing what I've already been doing, what has been done for, for many, many years as well already? Well, let's actually take a look at this traditional approach. And especially with medical education, it often creates a divide between the basic science and the clinical science. Because with medical education, what typically happens is the first year or so, you are in classroom setting where you have an instructor maybe lecturing on a series of basic science concepts, maybe the Krebs cycle or single transduction or, or other types of basic information. And, and then once you're done with that, you actually then go to the clinic and it's difficult to see where and how that applies in the clinical situation. So in addition to providing this kind of separation between these two areas, it's also as a result, there's no application of the knowledge. In this situation here, you can see the instructor is simply lecturing to the students, but the students can't apply that knowledge. They're simply provided the information and then they have to move on. Likewise, this, the third point on here is that acquisition and retention of this information is completely without regard to any relevance. So you might be given the Krebs cycle, you might be given the ideas of single transduction, but you don't know why you even need to know it. You're not given the fact of knowing which drugs or, or particular diseases could affect these particular mechanisms in the body. And, and often this, this particular format it's actually very tedious and from your perspective as well as from the faculty's perspective because you're sitting there listening to us lecture on things and maybe there might be a certain percentage of what we're lecturing on that you already know and you have to sit there and you're bored. Um, we sit there and we have to lecture to you and, and we have to go through an hour and sometimes longer in terms of providing that information and that's, that's a very tedious process for us for both you and us. And in this day and age, it's actually a really inefficient use of your time. Why should you have to sit in front of a lecture hall and have a professor lecture on a topic that you already have a firm grasp on? There's no reason for you to, to hear that information again. It would be more important for you to actually focus your attention on learning the components of that topic that you don't have a firm grasp on. So you can gain a better knowledge of that particular topic. With a traditional approach, there's also no immediate feedback. And so as you can see here, the instructor is simply lecturing to these um, individuals. 
we have no idea if you are actually comprehending the information, if you understand the information, and this actually feeds into the last point here is that as, as faculty, we have no awareness of the student understanding until we actually administer an exam. And that's usually at the end of the course, we'll administer some type of an exam and find out, oh look, 30% um, of the students didn't understand what I said. Well, class is over, uh, maybe next year. And, and that's usually the mentality because there's not much you can do at that point, at least with a traditional approach. Now in contrast, with a problem-based learning session, the, these sessions are much more enjoyable for both the students as well as faculty. We are actually engaged, we're discussing the educational information. They're more stimulating for a more stimulating learning environment for all of us. Um, it's also self-directed learning. And, and in that sense, if a particular topic comes up, for example, the Krebs cycle, since I mentioned that already, you might know a lot about that, but there might be particular aspects of that that you don't know. Well, you can focus your learning on those aspects while another student can focus their learning on a different aspect of that content. So again, this is very self-directed and tailored towards your individual learning. This type of um, learning, problem-based learning, also promotes a more deeper rather than surface learning because rather than the instructor having to teach to the lowest denominator and teach and start teaching at the very basic levels and work their way up, you now can focus your learning on the particular areas that you don't know and actually expand your knowledge on that area, promoting again a much more deeper understanding of the content. Now, with problem-based learning, it also actually promotes a lot of interaction between the students and the faculty. As you can see in this picture, there's communication between the students, there's communication between the faculty, we're working together to solve a particular problem. And it also promotes, on the slide here we have, promotes interdepartmental collaboration, but I would also say interprofessional collaboration. We can bring individuals into the session that have expertises in different areas and have their knowledge add to the group discussion. And we can really start uh, an interprofessional or interdepartmental collaboration where everyone is bringing their particular expertise in to the learning environment, enhancing everyone's learning of the, of the particular case. Now, you might still be thinking, well, that's nice, but we know that the traditional approach works. And so why bother changing? If we, if we know something works, let's just do what works. We're not, this, this sounds like it's a good idea. It sounds like it'd be fun, but I want an education that's actually going to be tested and shown that it actually will lead to my enhancement of my knowledge. And actually with problem-based learning, there's a very extensive history with it. It was first introduced at McMaster University back in 1969 when they opened their, their um, school, when their school first opened. It then spread to various locations, Australia, Israel, Netherlands, and New Mexico. It was mostly started in new schools and smaller schools, which you can kind of imagine because, again, you're looking at um, very small groups working together, and new, un new schools obviously would lend themselves very nicely towards this because they didn't have a already established lecture format that was, um, they had to deal with in terms of faculty at the, at the university. But then actually Harvard in 1985 developed what they called a new pathway, and this was initially a parallel track where the students could go in this, in this parallel track and have a problem-based learning um, curriculum. And they decided to test this out. And as it turned out, the students absolutely loved it. And it quickly became the common pathway for Harvard University. And, and this pattern has happened over and over and over again now at various um, medical schools. And actually in 1991, um, somewhere on the order of 100 medical schools or 100 schools are using problem-based learning to, for delivery of their educational material, and that number has only increased since then. So this isn't a new technique. We're, we actually have some history with it, and it's been shown to work and work very, very effectively. So what is the process for a problem-based learning session? So I'm just gonna start this off and then I'll hand it over. So, let me just add this. So what's the overall process for a PBL session? 
So again, if you take a look at the traditional learning, with traditional learning, you're told what you need to know, you're then told to memorize it, or you have to memorize it, and then you are given an exam, you have problems assigned to you, and based upon your performance, that determines how well you do, or, or you, you can show how well you have acquired that information. With problem-based learning, it's actually flipped in the sense that you initially are given the problem. You're given the medical situation. You're given the case. You, you now have the problem. And what you have to do once you have that problem is then identify what you need to know in order to address or solve that problem. And so you go out and you research those things, and then you actually apply what you have learned to solving that problem. And although this particular um, linear model here is um, where they first depicted problem-based learning, this circular pattern actually lends itself much more um, ideally or, or realistically to what a problem-based learning process is, in the sense that initially, again, you have the patient, the, the presentation of the problem, and then once that problem is presented, your students can define what that problem is, they can define what they need to know in order to better understand that problem. And then the students, as it says on here, goes out, the students go out and engage in independent learning. They go out, you work with other students, you look for resources, and you can even come, and as you picked it on this bottom panel here, they, they shouldn't share the information, they come back together, and they bring all that information back. So they research all that information, they bring it back to the group, and then the students actually present all of their information. So there's, so there's students are working and, and working in that group, presenting that information to each other. And as a result, and of course this promotes obviously this self-learning, but as a result, you now learn what more about that problem. And whereas there might have been a learning issue that you didn't realize you needed initially, but now that you have all this additional information, you then take a look back at that problem and think, you know, now that we know all this, we, need to, we, we now have additional learning issues. Or maybe there might be some more um, information about the case that's presented. And through that development of those new learning issues, this process now starts all over again. And the students go out and you research this information again, bring it back to the group, present to the group, you learn that information again, and, and as you acquire more information, you get more questions because you have, you're more knowledgeable on the material, and that leads to more questions that you can now ask because you know what questions to ask. And that's why this type of learning really does promote a more deeper understanding of the curriculum than simply having someone like one of us stand in front of you and, and talk for an hour or two hours. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Galvez. Uh, Dr. Groves talked about the process of a PBL session. Now, I would like to talk about your role as a student in the session. So right now, our PBL sessions, they happen every Monday, Wednesday, Friday for two hours. Each one of the facilitators, they work with a group of eight students. So we are both facilitators. We are in a, a classroom with eight students, and then the students are going to have a specific role in this PBL session. So starting, uh, I would like to introduce the leader. The leader is the student who ensures that the group stays on track and on time, is also helping the facilitator to make sure that you're gonna cover all the topics that need to be covered during the case, and also keeping the uh, group engaged in the session. The leader, they might also help to determine the order of uh, the learning issues are presented by the end of the day. They indicate when the group is ready to move to the next page or slide when they are discussing the problem-based learning. And also, in our process, the leader will receive peer feedback in the end of the week. Right now, this happens every Friday. So this is an important part of assessment, especially because we want you to be the best doctor that you can be. So having your peers providing you feedback is really important 
for the session. Uh, the leader is also the only role that does not rotate throughout the week. It stays the same. And the reason is because you need to have enough time of the group so then they can provide you one positive feedback and one item that you need to improve upon. So the next role would be the reader. So this person, the student will be in charge of reading the PBL pages uh, aloud to the group. Also we have the scribe who is responsible for taking notes during the PBL session with a particular emphasis in uh, keeping uh, a running list of potential learning issues and questions that the group might have. Uh, the scribe will be active working on whiteboard uh, but it's not uh, because uh, the scribe is just writing, cannot have an active role during the session. It's required that the student who is the scribe is also uh, being engaged in contributing in the group uh, as other students. So in the whiteboard, the students are going to start with the information of the case. Uh, then they're going to have a problem list hypothesis, action needed, and learning issues. And I'm gonna talk uh, about a little bit in a few slides. So, for the information, uh, you're gonna acquire everything that is uh, relevant for the case, and, which is uh, related with the, case, uh, with the patient, for example. Uh, Mr. White has 66 uh, years old. The problem is, is everything, uh, any past or present medical problems that are not related uh, necessarily with the case, but for example, if a, a patient takes a specific medication every day for diabetes, so this is going to be in your problem list. The hypothesis that students will brainstorm reasons why this problem is occurring with this specific patient. Uh, for the action needed, uh, the students are going to list the steps they need to, uh, to take to resolve uh, or better understand the problem. And finally, you have the learning issues. Uh, it's all additional information that needs to be learned to better understand and complete the task. So the learning issues, it's a really part, important part in the process. We ask the students to keep track on this because it's a way that they can make sure that they are achieving the goals for the case in the end of the session on Friday. We also have the searcher, uh, which is text uh, with quickly researching their laptop or cell phone, is the only student who is allowed to bring any kind of electronics to the session. Uh, so also is responsible to define any acronym or any uh, look to any normal uh, laboratory values or anything that could be quickly searched uh, search during the session. We also have a student who is the synthesizer that will keep track of the important learning points that they brought over the course for our PBL discussion and also is responsible to summarize in a coherent uh, way the learning issues in the end of the session. One should be the patient presenter, and this is also an important role. Every student is assigned, uh, one student is assigned in the following uh, session to present the patient for all the students. Uh, also, uh, they will receive uh, feedback from the facilitator about their presentation. And this is an important part of the assessment where the students and the facilitator is assessing uh, the student to present the patient. I believe this is one of uh, the important topics in our uh, role, uh, uh, you as a student, because this is going to help you to be the better doctor in the future if you know how to summarize what you listen from your patient when you are in the clinic. Uh, we also have uh, AB Tech who is responsible to setting up all the technology. Uh, we, uh, right now we are starting our sessions in the morning, so it's really important that the student is prepared with all the slides uh, set so we can uh, start our session on time. 
And at the least, uh, but not least important, is the feeder. <laughs> it's one role that I really enjoy because they bring us snacks, coffee, or whatever food to keep the group energized. So we talk about your role as a student during the PBL session. Again, we have this group of eight students working together to solve a medical case and achieve the learning issues. But also there are some ground rules uh, that they are important to make uh, sure that the session is happening in a half way, in a professional way, and it's working for everybody as a group. So the first one is don't be late. This is a required question. Uh, is a required um, thing for the PBL because uh, if you are medical, uh, if, you're, if you're a doctor, cannot be uh, late to see your patients, right? So it's required that you are on time. You cannot be late. Uh, the second is no personal electric, uh, electronic devices. As I mentioned, the, the searcher is the only uh, student who is allowed to bring a computer and a phone and search for quick things as acronyms or any lab results. Uh, the third point is everyone needs to be uh, to contribute and be engaged. Uh, so sometimes your facilitator can uh, guide the session asking a student who is quiet in the corner some questions. So we want to make sure that you are contributing equally as the other students and we are able to provide you uh, good feedback in the end of the session as well. And the last, be respectful of others and their opinions because as a doctor, it's important to not be judgmental with your patients. It's important that you listen and you care for your patients. So if you work well in a group, you're gonna be a good doctor in the future. So we would like to wrap up our uh, session with uh, the brief. First, uh, Dr. Galves um, explained to us what is a PBL. He also said what is, uh, why we are using PBL, because we are uh, doing an active learning and we are uh, seeking for improving critical thinking. I also talked about the process and the rules for a PBL session. Uh, we have uh, sessions with eight students. Each, each student has an important role in this process. And the last, we discuss what are the rules for the PBL session. So now I would like to open for questions. Uh, is there anything related with the session today that you would like to clarify with us? Please, you can type and I will read it and one of us will be able to answer or clarify any question do you have. Let's wait a couple more minutes. minutes absolutely. Yeah. Okay, uh, I can read and Dr. Galvez will answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Would you recommend PBLs be recorded? So I think we can both obviously mm -hmm. offer some input. Um, so would PBLs be recorded? Um, I don't think that they are beneficial in the same way that you typically think of a lecture being recorded where with a lecture, people often ask for lectures to be recorded so that they can watch the lecture again and again or watch them at their own convenience at home or, or whenever they have time. With a problem-based learning session, you really need to be engaged in the group. You need to be communicating and discussing with the group what is happening, um, what are, you need to be contributing the intellectual content with the group and, and helping move the, um, the move the group forward in terms of their education. Yeah, in addition, we might record a, a few PBL sessions just for assessment of our own faculty for peer mm -hmm. feedback or training or maybe an improvement of our curriculum. But even if you're recording a, a session, we're gonna let the students know and also the facilitator know that this is specific session is being recorded. How are roles decided? This is a great question. 
is there something in check so that students do not stay as the same rule every time? Yeah, so uh, the roles are decided in the beginning of the session or in the end of the previous session. So because I have the AV tech and the feeder, so usually why I do, what I do with my students is we assign some of the roles on the session, the, the session uh, before, because if you're the feeder, you wanna make sure you're baking cookies for us. <laughs> or if you're the AV tech person, you need to be prepared on time to set up the equipment. But uh, for example, the leader are gonna stay the same, so you don't need to assign this again. But yes, the answer, the students, except for the leader, they rotate uh, roles uh, throughout this, the week. Uh, is there something check so that students do not oh, stay? Yeah, um, sorry. So I address one quick thing. You asked how the roles are decided. Yeah. And for a large sense, because problem-based learning is self-directed and, and so the focus is not on the faculty but more on the student. Oh, yeah. You decide within your group who the roles are, who's going to be doing which role. We as facilitators do step forward and and insists that the same people are not always doing the same roles um, because again we have to assess your um, performance in each of the roles but we don't assign your particular roles we that is for your to do yeah. for you for you to do obviously within the session all except for the patient presenter mm -hmm. um, the patient presenter is one where eventually you will be obviously working in the clinic and you'll be doing rounds and in that particular situation you don't know if the um, if the doctor is going to call on you to ask ask you to present the patient it could be any one of you and so for that particular role we assign that and, and the students have no idea who's going to be the patient presenter everyone has to be ready to present the patient yeah and again this is a your session is very organic the students uh, they also, oh, I want to be the feeder next session. I want to be the searcher. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, is there something you check so that students do not stay? Yeah, we already answered it in the mm -hmm. same row every time. So there are three two-hour PBL sessions per week, correct? Correct. Correct. <laughs> are students still exposed to the traditional learning style throughout the week? Yes, but uh, very few. So there are other... Um, activities, learning activities that are within the week. This is not the only form of delivery of educational material and there's certain types of information that lend themselves very nicely to a lecture. There's some types of educational material that you just need to be shown how to do it or you need to be explained and there are other aspects of education that work bet much better and you gain much better understanding of that information if you actually work through and, and and are given the tools to understand and move forward. And here we've, we've done a very good job of trying to of recognizing which information suits which learning modality the best. Would you be able to elaborate a bit on how review works at the end of a case? Yes, I think you're talking about, uh, we have two assessments during the week. We have the case presentation, on Wednesday and Fridays, and we also have the peer evaluation on Fridays, uh, and we also have uh, assessments in the mid-week, uh, mid-evaluation, and in the end of the block. So we have a rubric for each uh, assessment. Would you like to explain a little bit? Um, I mean, in terms of the, the rubric, I mean, in terms of the assessment, I mean, we are obviously looking at whether or not you have done a good job at identifying particular areas for where to acquire that information, how to acquire that information, um, how effectively are you working within the group, are you um, a team player within the group, are you contributing, are you adding to it, um, and so those are, in a very general sense, some of the items that are on the rubric. Yeah, exactly. What would the students say is the most beneficial part of PBL? I would say it is, it is fun. <laughs> <laughs> you barely feel the two hours. It's very fast, it's very dynamic. And another thing that I would say would be a, a benefit that the students would, would recognize is that you often don't realize that you are kind of going through this learning process 
even though you really are. And this feeds back a little bit what you were saying in the sense that, you know, before you know it, the two hours are up. And, and you know, whereas if you were to sit in a lecture hall for two hours, you would really feel it. <laughs> that would yes. be without a doubt. A lot of attendees have some questions in the chat. A big question is, is if we could have a potential example of what a PBL question would be. Mm. So what a PBL question would be. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is this is not a um, typical delivery yeah. of, um, of a question like you would get on an exam. And so it's more of where you are given a particular situation or a particular scenario and now you have to work through that scenario and you have to identify what do you need to know in order to answer or address that particular situation. But I can give you a simple example. So for example, let's say in the cardiovascular block you have a EKG exam. One question that I could ask is, is this normal or abnormal? Is this Absolutely. fair? Or, or even if you are looking at that EKG for the first time, how do you read an EKG? Exactly. I mean, even taking it back to a very simplistic understanding is like, well, we need to know how do we even approach this problem. Do you know what is EKG? <laughs> exactly. Do you know what the different waves are? Is there one problem per session or one problem per week? It's so, one case per week, one problem per week. But as you'll very quickly realize, patients don't always present with a single problem. We are all human and we have multiple issues that we're dealing with and the same is the case with our cases. These are complex cases and they have multiple issues that are dealing with. How does engineering intuitive medicine take a role in PBL? So in terms of how engineering and intuitive medicine takes a role in PBL. For one thing, in terms of the medical aspect, I will say it's a medical case that we're dealing with. And I gave the example of the Krebs cycle or um, single transduction, but if, in order to, you don't simply, or you're not gonna simply have to learn that, that material, but rather you're now gonna be looking at a drug that might affect a particular molecule in the Krebs cycle, or you might be looking at a particular condition that might affect single transduction. And so in order to understand that disorder or how that drug's working, you need to understand the basic science that goes with it. Now, in the same token, engineering fits perfectly with that as well, because in order to understand single transduction, there are engineering principles and aspects that you need to understand in order to understand that mechanism. There are other engineering aspects of this particular person um, has, so in order to understand some of the dynamics within the body, and, um, you need to understand um, the engineering, underlying engineering principles. And, and I'm gonna stop with the engineering and turn it over to the engineer that's sitting right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, I think everything is integrated in our curriculum. So uh, EKG is also related with engineering, right? So if you're thinking in terms of engineer lab, how you place the electrodes, do you know what is an electrode? Do you know how to read the input or, or a voltage of a signal? So everything in our case is integrated the, uh, in a way that the students can learn all the concepts to better understand the case, but even, even though to better understand the patient as a role. So uh, is, PBL, is PBL working parallel to what is being learned the other days of the week? Yes. Absolutely, and so what is, one of the things that we've done here is that the PBL session is, or, or the case that's in that PBL, it really serves as the anchor for which the rest of the rest of the week uh, the subject matter for the rest of that week. And so if you are under, looking at a case that deals with a particular disease or disorder, that disease fits into a larger group and, and a lar there's, there's a larger body of information that, that goes with that. And so all the activities within that week are centered around that idea. Now they won't be, the, the other activities won't be necessarily um, further explaining the case, because that's for the PBL session, they'll be taking the topics of that case and expanding upon them. And so you have a much broader, deeper understanding of 
the other aspects of, of that class of diseases or that class of drugs. How do you balance PBL with student schedules or if any student needs to take an extended leave? So if a student needs to take an extended leave, he, will, he or she work with academic affairs and the student's affairs to make a plan when you're leaving and how you can remediate those PBL sessions. And I'll address the first point in the sense of how do you balance PBL with, with student schedule? Well, the PBL is really the, the anchor of the student schedule. That's the consistent aspect of the student schedule. All the other activities um, change from week to week. And, you know, you, the, the anatomy lab is probably, I would say, the one thing that's a, the most consistent and obviously the engineering labs. But the timing for those labs, how long those labs take, whether or not you have a lecture or a TBL, a team-based learning activity, all those other things, are, are all those other forms of educational delivery, they're all fit with around those PBL sessions. Can one student take two roles during the PBL session? No, we have eight <laughs> roles, eight yeah. students. <laughs> yeah, no. Has there been any research that shows that PBL medical programs sufficiently prepare students for the U.S. nearly step one boards? Yes. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead? Since no, saying? you go ahead. <laughs> um, no, I mean, there has. There has been. Um, there's been a lot of studies, some studies showing that you actually have better board performance, some studies showing that you have comparable board performance, um, whether you, regardless of which study you look at, we're not hurting you at all with doing a PBL. If anything, it's, it's um, much more beneficial towards you. And also, too, you need to take a step back and realize, although the boards are extremely important, what our focus here, and, and we, we realize the boards are important and, and we realize that component of it, but we're training doctors. We're not training people how to take a step, uh, step one exam. And the aspect of that, being able to learn how to work within a group, communicate within a group, work within a team, that's a component that you're really, you, that's an added, added advantage of a problem-based learning session that you would not be getting with a team with a kind of traditional approach. Well, we answer all the questions. Thank you for attending our webinar series and thank you for watching. Thank you very much.